All right, good evening, everybody. That was nice. It got quiet exactly at 7 o'clock. That was, that was perfect. Is it not 7 o'clock? What? what? Uh, so my phone said 6.59 like a few seconds ago. That clock says 7. We changed that today, though, so that, that could have been us. That's possible. Yeah, yeah. I'll see if I can finish a minute early, just to... Hey, hey, I said I'll see. I said I'll see, all right? I am done making those kind of promises. I'm done. I'm done. We're gonna, we're gonna go at least two hours tonight. Buckle up. <laughs> I only have one lesson planned, but I'm just gonna go. All right. Uh, we're going to be starting on page, chapter 4 starts on page 37, we'll get there eventually. We'll also get to Second Peter chapter 2, just getting all the books open. All right, so hopefully you're enjoying the study. Uh, I've been enjoying studying for it and going over some of the questions uh, throughout the week. That's been very beneficial. Um, so tonight, I think we actually get to like the zealous for truth you know the title of the series i think we're actually getting to some of that because we are digging into things about some of the false teachers that peter is writing to address so while we've been dealing with other things related to that we haven't really gotten into the false teachers too much that'll come up this week and probably for the next few weeks um, and this week fortunately I always enjoy Peter is linking a lot of stuff to Old Testament so I always like bouncing back and digging into some of that we won't go in too in depth with it but uh, paints a pretty clear picture so why don't we open up in prayer and get started with the text Lord uh, thank you for this night thank you for everyone who's able to make it out I uh, just pray you'd be with us during this time of study uh, that you would uh, open our minds, our hearts to uh, whatever you have for us in your word tonight. And I uh, just pray you'd be with us in this. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. So, I do not have the introduction in my book. Uh, can I get a volunteer to read the introductory paragraph to Lesson 4? Thank you. That's a long verse that they, that they open that with. Yeah. Okay, so, question one. How do you respond when you see a danger sign? Do you respect it or disregard it? I feel like there's going to be a lot of similarities to what we said about doctor's orders the other week. <laughs> I got you. Yeah, yeah. So you just, you take it at face value. Yeah, okay. Okay. Is anyone highly disrespectful towards warning signs? We, we got any of those here? No. All right, question two. What is the silliest danger sign you have ever seen? Ah, coffee hot, yes. <laughs> yeah, I know why they exist, but it usually makes me laugh a little bit to myself, like every time I see it, and it's not that funny. But you know when you're driving somewhere and you're going over a bridge, and it says, bridge may be icy, and it's like July, and you're like, it's not icy. It's not that funny, but for some reason, when it's the middle of summer, it gets me every time. <laughs> Don't use your hair dryer in the tub. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you got to be careful about the icy bridges. Yeah. Get you every time. Okay. I don't know that we'll really have an answer to question three, but how would you respond if our church had a danger sign on the front door that read, Beware of false teachers? Would you see that sign as silly? Yeah, yeah, false teachers inside. Like, there's significant danger of this, watch out. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like if you're going on to like biblical 
sections of YouTube or something. That would be more of a helpful, uh, more of a helpful sign, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Ouch. Wow. I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, start having polls. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, this got away from me. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, why don't we get to the text, and like we've been doing since it's such a short text, we'll read the whole thing, I'll get your cursory thoughts, nothing too in-depth, and then we'll dig in. All right, Second Peter 2, we're going to read 1 through 9. But there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who pri uh, privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring destruction upon them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the world. For that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Whew. <laughs> He's getting tough. Okay, any, any cursory thoughts? Oh, um, so when you're counting the, yeah, he's not like the eighth person on the planet, but as you're counting the genealogies, uh, Adam being the first, Noah is the seventh generation from Adam, so he's the eighth. Yeah, there's, yeah, that's what's happening there. Mm hmm. Ah, so that would be referring to those saved in the ark. Psh, New King James. Um, so, yeah, I'd, of course, have to look at the Greek, which I don't know that well. Um, yeah, I guess that works either way, because that is, what I said is correct. So, like, gene, with the, I believe, unless I'm, I, the, so with the genealogy, that's, he is the eighth from Adam, and then, of course, eight people are also saved in, his, in the ark. Um, yeah, and eight is typically considered the number of new creation. Um, so, because you have, you know, the seven, period of seven is, is the week or completion, and then the thing after that is the new creation. So, yeah, there's probably a lot of imagery going on there. Yeah. Any other cursory thoughts or questions? Uh, is it... Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. We'll, we'll dig into the, the angels in full. Yeah, no problem. All right, so I'll read verse 1 again. Uh, but there were false prophets among... Okay, actually, why don't we back up and read the last verse of chapter 1, which we read, we, we went over last week, but you want to see the contrast that Peter's working here. He was talking about prophecy and Scripture in what we studied last week. Verse 21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Talking about the prophets in Israel. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, 
and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So, as Peter does later, like we discussed, he's taking these other biblical examples from the Bible and applying them to future judgment. He takes, okay, Israel, yeah, they had their true prophets, they had all the the prophets of God, all the, the words of God, and they had a whole bunch of false prophets. And in like manner, your, this church specifically and churches will end up with what he's calling false prophets. So, first question, what would we consider a false prophet? Or how would you maybe want to reframe that for our context? I think you could say that. Someone who deliberately changes the word of God for their benefit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can be sincerely wrong. Um, okay, so let's build on that. D- does intent matter? Okay. Yeah, lack of repentance for, for the teaching. and um, How severe do you think... Okay, so let, let me ask two clarifying questions. We said intent matters. However, you can just be sincerely wrong in ways that are unacceptable I think we could say that like okay if you're going to take any major doctrine and you say you know what I think I'm sincerely right that Jesus didn't actually rise from the dead like I I I think I see this in scripture this is the evidence I think it's a spiritual thing okay let's say I sincerely believe that would I fall under this category or am I just stupid Okay, so then are we distinguishing between a false prophet and, let's just say, a heretic? So, yeah, I'm I'm trying to see what you guys think on this. Um, Because, yeah, we don't really refer to, like, we don't refer to Pastor Kohler as our our church's prophet. So when you're dealing with, okay, well, what's a false prophet? Like, we don't have, we we don't have our honest prophet. Who's, Who's our true prophet? Uh, so we, we don't really speak in these terms anymore. Yeah, yeah, that, that'd be a good way to put that. So the way the New Testament especially uses the role of the, the prophet, they're drawing a lot from Old Testament imagery. Um, so certain people spoke with prophetic gifts like the apostles. Um, okay, Revelation, excellent example. You know, there's like legitimate prophecy. Usually what the word prophet means is a foretelling, like a herald of some kind. So specifically when applied to things in the church, it is a foretelling of the word of God, as opposed to not necessarily a foretelling of the word of God. It's not prophecy. These false, like false prophets assume, yeah, so heralding a message as opposed to predicting the future. So technically, we, would, we don't call Pastor Kohler the prophet. Uh, he would reject that title, and good. Um, <laughs> however, when, especially within the New Testament context, when we're talking about the gift of prophecy, it's usually wrapped up with the gifts of leading, teaching, because he is proclaiming the word of God, even though we fully understand he is not, and anyone in a pulpit is not on the level of a prophet like Isaiah, Jeremiah, or one of the apostles. Uh, there, there are, yeah, there are many other churches. Um, yeah, yeah, you can end up in certain churches where, oh yeah, Apostle Bill is with us today. Everyone, uh, you know, say hi to Apostle Bill. Um, and you need the, uh, <laughs> poor choice. Yeah. Um, yeah, there are some churches that have apostles and they believe, well, you, you also need a prophet to, to go with the pastoring team and they get into some interesting places. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bargain, yeah. Buy one, get one 50% off, something like that, yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Okay, so when we're dealing with the idea of the false prophet, they do seem to be people who are twisting Scripture, and like you were saying with verse 3, as some, similar to what Ron is saying, tend to twist Scripture for their own gain. I think someone can be... You know, the Bible doesn't sit down with these, like, dictionary definitions to define them, but it seems there can be a difference between a false teacher and, let's say, someone who teaches something false, like a sincere heretic. That exists. Um, you can just, like, you can just be a good old-fashioned heretic. Plenty of those throughout history. And then you can be a false teacher who seems to be deceiving. They know what the Word says and disregard it and seem to do their own thing. Again, the, the, the categories are not super clear-cut. They're not defined that well. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so in verse 1, we're going to assume nothing's out there. Um, yeah, so we have false prophet or false teachers, false prophet. Uh, yeah, and he, he uses both terms, false prophets and false teachers talks about them bringing in uh, damnable heresies. It's really like destructive heresies. That, that would be a simple way of understanding that. Um, and even denying the Lord that bought them. That could be something like a outright rejection of, you know, some nature, uh, some area of the doctrines of salvation. Or it could just be as they are teaching false things, intentionally perverting the Word of God, they are denying the saving work of the message of what's actually being taught. So you can take that a couple different ways. Um, so question four. I think we know this. Um, should we expect false teachers to infiltrate groups of believers today to explain? I mean, I think we all know the answer. Yeah. Yeah, and human nature doesn't change. Um, humans can change. Like, people, people change. Um, otherwise, there's no sense in most of the stuff we're talking about of intentional spiritual growth and salvation and different stuff. People absolutely change. Human nature does not change. Um, yeah, and uh, we won't dig into it like, we won't go and read it, but questions uh, 5 and 6, I have the instruction to read Acts 20, verse 29, where he says, uh, how did Paul describe false teachers? Uh, I actually referenced this, like, last week, I think. Uh, that's where he is saying goodbye to the elders of the Ephesian church, and he warns them that grievous wolves, he calls them, will enter in among the flock and basically, you know, be on guard for uh, the teaching that may end up coming. And I think question seven is interesting, just kind of to spitball a little bit. Uh, what procedures might help a church, uh, yeah, what procedures might help a church put in place, that's oddly worded, to identify false teachers who desire to spread their beliefs through the church's teaching ministries? No, that's a good, that's a really good point, about like praying for discernment in these things, because um, as we will see, like, False teachers don't typically come out and be like, hey, I'm a false teacher, you know? Like, that's a lot of times the big things that can be really easy to see, but it'll be the subtle things that end up, can end up making really big impacts, some, some of the cracks you don't notice right away. Yeah. Yeah, if it's bad enough, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's fair. Right. Yeah, it'd probably depend on the severity. If, uh, you know, one of us is, if one of us is in the pulpit and say something that maybe it's not pastor's cup of tea, but it's like, okay, you know, it, it's not, not what I would say. You're probably not going to get, you know, tackled. But, uh, yeah, if you, if you, 
Yeah, if you come up and you're like, you know, I think the Bible's a little ambiguous about the virgin birth. Like, you know, maybe it'd be like, you know what, I think we need to, we need to take a step back here. Let's, uh, let's back up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there are definitely levels. Yeah. Yeah, 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 anytime we have a guest speaker, just ready to go on the guitar. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, no, it's worthy. It's worthy of uh, stopping something. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I think we basically got statement of faith, Know the people, know the testimony, be on guard, and tackle if necessary. That's, that's how we prevent false teaching, mostly. Yeah. We'll get there. Oh, yeah, no, it, we'll, we'll, we'll be covering it. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, we'll be covering it. Um, okay, so... Oh, yeah, no, we're covering it right now. Okay. Yeah, because, um, yeah, the, the note I have is, okay, like he said, you know, even denying the Lord. So, okay, how does one do that? So, for starters, as Peter is writing, I don't know, Shortly before his death, we don't know exactly how long, so somewhere around, let's say, 67 AD, he's probably about, he's probably right in the beginning stages of what I'm going to call proto-Gnosticism. We've talked about the Gnostics before. We won't go in depth. There's countless books that could be written on, that are written on that. Um, The Gnostic groups, the Gnostic heresies that formed formed more in the second century as like these organized, formal offshoots. So Peter could sort of be talking about this, because Paul sort of talks about it when you're dealing with uh, some of the mysticism in the Colossian church. It's like the forerunners of these Gnostic heretics. Gnostics went everywhere from saying Jesus is was just a man, you know, good teacher, Messiah even, just not God, all the way to God is perfect, flesh is evil, so Jesus couldn't actually have been in the flesh. He just looked like he was. So, like, you have two extremes of, okay, how, how do I deny Jesus? Well, he's either, like, you're going to one extreme, fully man or fully God, and not meeting in the middle, It's as in Christian orthodoxy. So the fact that... They're denying the Lord. These people are promised swift destruction. I would take this to mean, uh, I don't know if it's in the book somewhere in this chapter. Um, we, we might read it, we might not. I don't remember if I underlined it. Where they said, okay, basically it would seem that these false teachers are not, were not, Christians in the truest sense. They may be part of a local congregation, but we have many clear teachings throughout the Bible that if you you don't become a child of God and then, oh, well, you thought or taught or did the wrong thing, so now you're not. That, as Pastor was mentioning, we believe in eternal security. So if you are saved, you are saved. You're you're made a new creature, new creation. You were a son of Adam. You're now a son of Christ. So like your your citizenship has changed. Your eternal destiny has changed. And we don't believe, uh, I've heard it said well, that what you did not gain by moral perfection, you cannot lose by moral imperfection. So you didn't get saved because you were such an awesome person, so you can't lose your salvation because maybe you're not an awesome person. So those who are told to be, said to be denying the Lord, destined for judgment, we would typically consider them not to have actually been 
saved, especially since we're talking about people who are intentionally twisting Scripture for their own means. Now, we know there are other branches who believe you can lose your salvation. Um, yeah, we would have some fighting words with them. Like, that's, that just doesn't seem to be at all what Scripture teaches. So, yeah, we would consider, you know, group of people destined for destruction by the wrath of God. These aren't Christians. This is not the group we're dealing with. We're dealing with very, very false teachers. I mean, in this context... Yeah, I mean, Peter is specifically talking about the false teachers that would come in the church, come out of the church, yeah. As, as opposed to, are you going somewhere? Oh, sure, sure, sure. That's a very literal denial of the Lord, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, I don't. Yes, yeah, I do understand. And, um, you know, throughout church history, there have been, there have been many Peters, you know, um, who under threat, or actu- threat of or actual torture recant their faith and then later end up, you know, kind of recovering. And you have groups, people who were denied their faith, were released, went like, wow, this is the worst thing I ever did, I denied the Lord, go back strong and eventually get martyred. Like, these people exist all throughout church history. Um, yeah, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So there's, there's a distinction for sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Verse 2. I need to move so much faster. Okay, verse 2. Many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Basic points of that verse. False teachers are popular. Why do you think that is? They tell you what you want to hear sometimes. Yeah, what is that, Titus? I think, yeah. Yeah, tickling the ears. It's, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Every good cult leader has, has charisma. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, and you notice the second half, it's that they're... Part of the destruction of what they're doing is they lead people to speak poorly of the real thing. And we see this all the time. I'm sure you can think of countless examples of, okay, this person on TV, you know, oh, they bought what with their church's funds? And they go, oh, see, Christians are just about the money. You know, like, okay, this guy wants his private jet. This guy has a $16 million house. You know, they always about the money. Like, yeah, yeah, Rolls Royce. I mean, I wouldn't mind one. That's fair. That <laughs> there are demons on the plane. Yeah, that Kenneth Copeland video. If you haven't, yeah, I don't have time to get into it. I, I, I could find myself on the side of getting the jet, not for his crazy reasons. <laughs> If you're like, I shouldn't get into this. If it's like, hey, you're like a top level, like, like, okay, you're a Billy Graham level evangelist back in the day. You're like, okay, I'm going to 50 cities in, you know, the next this many months. We, you know, we're flying city to city. We're in like five cities a week, um, preaching to stadiums of like 10, 20,000 people, you know. Okay, and you're like, hey, you know, we go to Africa. They don't have, like, major airports in the places we're going. Like, okay, I think there's a place for, like, a private plane. Not because it's a tube filled with demons. Like, just, j- just, just pull it back. Like, just, <laughs> you already got your jet. Just say something sensible. Okay. And we understand this. And fortunately, we can laugh 
Um, I feel like if at some point you gave like your last $5,000 to this venture, uh, it wouldn't be as funny, you know? And yeah, we can laugh, but then people, like there are plenty of other people who think like, oh yeah, Christians are all about money. You see all these people on TV. Uh, they've never been to like a Baptist church. Um, so I don't know. And th this, this kind of stuff happens all the time, not just with money by any stretch. Um, yeah, okay. Let's, let's look at verse 3. Through covetousness shall they, with feigned words, make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. All right, so judgment is not waiting. What do you think of that whole, and I, I was trying to get away from money, but what do you think of that uh, feigned words make merchandise of you? Oh, I don't think that's what Peter's talking about, um, but, yeah, 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 but yeah, I mean, that, that happened in Acts, we read that, yeah. Yeah, and you can s usually spot that after a while, right, because there's a big difference, like, okay, so we have plenty of volunteers to do different things at the church, and hopefully you use people according to their gifts. So like, okay, if you can't play the piano, we don't ask you to play the piano. Like, it's just, it's that simple. Like, Catherine plays the piano very well. She plays the piano. Um, you know, if you despise children, we don't ask you to do the nursery. Like, it's just, it, you know, uh, and all the way up to like preaching, teaching, different things like that. I know what she said. <laughs> Um, and so there's a difference between like, hey, God gives his people gifts to be used for his kingdom. Do that, you know, bear fruit. And then there's a the big difference between that and the person who just pushes very hard. Like, oh, you, whether it's money, whether it's your time, your gifts, um, you know, you can see who it's about pretty quick, like how much is demanded or asked of people. Um, do these people tend to bear positive fruit or are they getting quickly burned out? Um, and sometimes, I mean, that can happen by accident too and just overwork and some neglect. But uh, yeah, there tends to be a big difference between someone who is trying to use you for their own personal gain, own personal ends, and like, hey, you're gifted, you're a member of the body of Christ, let's, let's serve one another. Uh, so, yeah, you can typically spot that, I would hope. Um, yeah. Yeah, and they do... Nah, I don't need to say that. Okay. Okay, verse 4. We're getting to Ron's. Uh, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And that's awkward because he's, we're stopping halfway through his thought process. Uh, what was your question, Ron? So, it would appear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a couple different approaches to this verse. So, uh, one, I will let you know the word that is... Tr there are three different words in the New Testament that could translate it into English as hell. Uh, they are Hades, Gehenna, and here we have the word Tartarus, uh, which if you're familiar with Greek mythology, you may know this term. Uh, because Peter's writing in Greek, you know. Um, so there was a conception of even, you know, the Hebrew worldview of the underworld where, or the, like the realm of the dead, of the, what he describes here, chains of darkness, or like a, a gloomy prison. So we're aware that it seems like most 
demons, fallen angels, whatever, are out and about. Jesus deals with a whole lot of them. Uh, we believe Lucifer is out and about doing Luciferian things. You know, um, you have a whole different hosts of demonic beings like the, the, the principalities, the powers, the different things that are talked about, especially in Paul. With what Peter's talking about, you really have two choices. So if you follow a certain route, people will take uh, the Genesis 1 through 6 account because of the writings of the book of Enoch, which we don't have time to dig fully into Enoch. Enoch is not scripture. Uh, the, the book of Enoch is not scripture. It's something they knew very well. It was, it's a second temple Jewish book. So like it was in the culture. And in the book of Enoch, um, you have... The sons of God, it's the Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Sons of God, daughters of men, produce Nephilim. And in the book of Enoch, it is told that their judgment is to be cast into like a deep, dark prison, this group of fallen angels. Um, so if you take that approach, then it's a specific group in chains of darkness bound until judgment. Of course, if you don't take that approach, if you take the view that the sons of God are the line of Seth, the daughters of women or the daughters of men are the line of Cain, um, and it's just a completely natural interaction here that is being judged, people typically think that, okay, some measure of fallen angels involved in the original rebellion of Lucifer are bound, while not all clearly are. Um, so, yeah, you have to sort of make some decisions there, what you think, uh, especially how you take the Genesis 6, if you think that's in play at all, or if you think this is just the, the fall of Lucifer type thing, that there are certain ones who are bound. Um, yeah, so the text is not super clear on it. Uh, it depends on several interpretive factors. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, this is the only place that Tartarus appears uh, in the, in the in the New Testament. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Like the like the things uh, bound in the Euphrates and all that. Yeah. So yeah, you yeah. If you dig into Revelation, then you have a whole bunch of other things going on. Um, because here, these ones are reserved for judgment. Um, yeah, whatever four things going on in the Euphrates, they're reserved for some other purpose. Um, so yeah, no, I don't know that those two are related, but it's, I mean, it's the same idea. They're dark spirits that are bound for a later purpose. Yeah. Yeah, so at the very least, however you take this, verse, you have angels that sinned and angel, you know, okay, angelic beings uh, would typically be considered more glorious, more powerful, more whatever than humans, and they are under the wrath of God for their sins, and this is the process that Peter's going to start going through. All right, verse 5. Another pretty, pretty simple one. This one's much simpler. Uh, and spared not the old world. God spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Um, we already discussed the one eighth person thing. Uh, any, any thoughts or questions on this verse? It seems pretty simple. We're all familiar with the story of Noah's flood. Um, yeah, once again, we had, okay, so we had angelic beings judged for rebellion. Then we have an account of the world judged for rebellion. Um, so Peter's just building his point as he is continuing on with these false teachers. A uh, few things with, we'll read verses 6 through 8. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making an example unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, 
vexed with his filthy conversation of the wicked. For the righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Um, any, any thoughts on that? So, uh, the, the word conversation, as it's used in the King James, typically means lifestyle, or like how you, how you live. Um, so, he's discussing Lot, who, when he calls him just Lot, it's not like, oh, it's just Lot, like just, justified, like the, this just man, Lot. When you hear him say that, you might think, like, ooh, that's not the lot that I remember reading about. Uh, but the insight that we get on this is, okay, well, Lot, you know, he's a, he lived with Abraham for years. He, he apparently knew the Lord. And as he lives in Sodom and Gomorrah, it says it, the, the, uh, all this, the filthy converse, so the, the, the immoral ways of life. Um, yeah, the, the immoral ways of life, the wicked. Uh, it says that it, you know, it vexed his righteous soul. So it's like a, it like tortures, it, it's a torture to his soul, and he just kind of becomes more and more degraded. Um, yeah, actually, why, why don't we read uh, page 44 in your book? Yeah, it'll be at the very top. Uh, Two paragraphs that I'll run through real quick. In the midst of his judgment upon the cities of the plain, God delivered Lot. That, That Lot was a righteous man may come as a surprise after reading the Genesis account. He appears as a man who has strayed a long way from God. While he was a hospitable man, he was also weak, was a drunkard, was morally depraved, He was so deeply embedded in Sodom that he had to be dragged out. Peter tells us that Lot was a righteous man who was distressed terribly by the uh, intemperate behavior of the wicked citizenry of Sodom. His rescue was due entirely to God's grace. God shows his grace to humans because of who he is, not because of who humans are. Lot was wearied with the shameless behavior of his neighbors. The word vexed means to torture. Filthy is descriptive of the debauchery, lust, drunkenness, and carousing of pagan behavior. The word conversation, verse 2 means, uh, verse 7 means lifestyle. Okay, so I did want to read one thing because I've mentioned it before, just like in passing, and we're actually talking about Sodom and Gomorrah now. So I found, yeah, don't worry, it won't take long. Um, So I got this from, this is from the Smithsonian's website. Now, of course, the Smithsonian are not Christian, so they have different takes on it, and we can, we can, if anyone is interested after class, we can talk. uh, Archaeologists believe they have found the site of Sodom and Gomorrah. They don't call it that. They call it Tal El Hammam. I don't don't know where they get the name from. but located at the like the mouth of the Dead Sea on the plains, this is what secular archaeologists, Smithsonian, many other places are saying. Uh, they, it's a leveled city. At the time of the disaster, second century BC, what I'm going to call Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, largest of three major cities in the valley, it likely acted as the region's political center. Okay. The mud brick buildings stood up to five stories tall. Over the years, archaeologists examining the structure's ruins have found evidence of a sudden high temperature destructive event. For instance, pottery pieces that were melted on the outside but untouched on the inside. Uh, Newspaper published in the Journal of Nature Scientific Reports examined possible causes of the devastation based on the archaeological record. The researchers concluded that Warfare, fire, volcanic eruptions, or an earthquake were unlikely culprits, as these events couldn't have produced the heat intense enough to cause the melting recorded at the scene. That left a space rock as the most likely cause. 
Because experts failed to find a crater at the site, they attributed the damage to an airburst created when a meteor or comet traveled through the atmosphere at high speed. It would have exploded about two and a half miles above the city in a blast a thousand times more powerful than the atomic bomb used at Hiroshima. Air temperatures would, rap would have rapidly risen to above 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit. Clothing, wood, would immediately burst into flames. Swords, spears, mud bricks, and pottery would begin to melt. Almost immediately, the entire city would be on fire. Seconds after the blast, a shock wave would have ripped through the city at a speed of roughly 740 miles per hour, faster than the worst tornado ever recorded. Cities and uh, the city's buildings were reduced to foundations and rubble. None of the 8,000 people or any of the animals within the city would have survived. Their bodies would be torn apart, their bones blasted into small fragments. Corroborating the idea that an airburst caused the destruction, the researchers found melted metals and unusual mineral fragments among the city's ruins. The archaeologists also discovered high concentrations of salt in the destruction layer of the site, possibly from the blast's impact on the Dead Sea or its shores. The explosion could have distributed the salt across a wide area, possibly creating high salinity soil that prevented crops from growing and resulted in the abandonment of the cities along the lower Jordan Valley for centuries. So, I'll, I'll level with you when you, if you like look this up, this city up on the Wikipedia page. Despite what I just read from the Smithsonian, researchers will bend over backwards to try to say, yeah, but it might not be Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, like, so it's from the exact same time frame uh, that is recorded in the Bible. It's in the exact same location. It is leveled by fire raining from the sky, city gone, and it's like the you know you know the like the idea of salting the fields, you know what they would do when armies conquered so you couldn't grow anything. If any like if anything screams of the judgment of God, wow. Um, yeah, so I just found it fascinating that there's like I don't know. That, that's as good as you can really get for me from archaeological data on this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so it's it's very interesting. We you know we, we can really easily kind of toss some Old Testament stories aside. Some of the things that are more like that seem there's nothing more like fantastical in our opinion than the oh God raining down fire and brimstone like oh what you know Zeus throwing his thunderbolt. What else do you do with that data? Like, that's exactly what the Bible said happened. Um, so, yeah, no, it's not a... It's cool and also kind of unsettling. Like, that. it's archaeologists, and these aren't Christian people. Um, yeah. Yeah, the place is full of sulfur, brimstone, and salt. And you're like, yeah, I've read the Genesis account. I don't, like, what else do you do with it? And uh, some of the researchers go out of their way to be like, we can't say this because it would support a certain view of biblical literalism. Um, they're pretty, like, they're, they're fairly unashamed in that, where it's like, um, yeah, we, yeah, all this happened, you know, exactly like it was said to, but we don't want to really, like, nail this down because it would actually mean the... <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I think we'll have to leave it. We didn't really have anything else. That's fine. We could have reread the last couple of verses again, but um, yeah. So we started digging into false teachers, and Peter's promise and warning is that actually I'll just say his his point is twofold. Okay, that. The things that he mentioned, okay, he mentioned fallen angels, and then he mentions the, the, the judgment of the earth with Noah. Noah is saved from the destruction, from the judgment of sin. In Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot and his immediate fa some of his immediate family are saved from the destruction, the judgment for sin. So Peter's sort of doing a, a dual thing here. He's saying, okay, yeah, there are gonna be false teachers, God knows how to judge the wicked, 
and he knows how to save the righteous who are like bystanders, let's say. He's still going to tell them to be very vigilant and, you know, be careful, don't be led astray. But he's, by the examples he's using, it's a, it's a dual promise there that God knows how to judge the wicked and he knows how to save the righteous. Uh, so I think we'll leave it there. Again, I would encourage you, uh, the making of personal questions have been very good. Got a journal going, a, a notebook going that I've been keeping track of these. Uh, it's, been, it's been good. Book has some solid questions, but we don't have time for that. So why don't we close in word of prayer? Lord, uh, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word, for this study, uh, for uh, this, this letter that uh, still survives, uh, preserved by, by your power, by your sovereignty. Uh, we thank you for it. We thank you that we can uh, learn things that were not only important to the early church, but things that are still incredibly relevant for us today. I pray we would uh, consider the word that we would uh, be hopeful, I guess, that uh, you will deal with uh, those who actively try to deceive, those who are trying to use your word for their own gain, and that you would uh, keep uh, faithful people safe, faithful Christians safe uh, from different errors, different heresies, different uh, false teachers that, that could arise throughout the church. Uh, so we thank you. Pray you'd be with us. Bring us back safely next week. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. And for the record, when I said church, I was thinking universal, like out and about, not, you know. <laughs> We're good. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>